Uh, so I'm Michelle like said, my name is Sam. I have four year Lenore student. So for my first Warcraft, I was, was skiing. Uh, for the majority of it, and second, I was a Ray Hall Letterman planning and racing team in Hilliard. And so I'll be going in reverse order, starting with my second and then moving to my first. First line, so Ray Hall Racing, as it's colloquially known, was started in 1992 by Bobby Ray Hall, who's probably one of the best in American uh, racing drivers, won the 8500, that sort of stuff. And so they race in two series, they race in the 80s, that's like 8500. All of that stuff is in Indianapolis, so I didn't see that side at all. I saw their sports car racing team, so they race uh, modified BMWs, their BMW factory team. So BMW basically just gives them a car and says, don't crash it. Um, and so my mentor is the general manager of the facility, Steve Dixon. And so I chose this walkabout uh, first because it was uh, relatively easy to, to get into. I had the connection already there. So that was great, and I loved cars from a young age. A family of car dealers, so I've been around cars for a long time, and thought you know this is the best way to learn about them. You know, taking them apart, working on them, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I didn't do a whole lot of that. I primarily cleaned things. So the first two weeks, first week was I think entirely cleaning. I don't think I did anything except clean the first week. The second week was about three quarters cleaning, and then it kind of tapered off to about half cleaning. Uh, in between cleaning, I pushed a lot of cars. So the other thing that that Ray Hall does, so they're closely associated with BMW in North America, and so they take care of BMW's 25 classic race cars. And so they take those to events, make sure they run, keep them clean, that sort of stuff. So pushed them around, loaded them on trucks, unloaded them, cleaned them, took them apart, that sort of stuff. I built shelves basically to prove that uh, I know how to use a ratchet. Marginally well. Uh, um, I worked in the gearbox department, so if you're not familiar with, with what a gearbox is, it's what connects the engine to the wheels. And so every time the, uh, the previous car, this is the car that they race now, every time that that comes back from a the race, they take everything apart. So they remove the engine, transmission, most of the body work, <coughs> suspension, all that sort of stuff, and check it. So the gearbox itself weighs about 200 pounds. So they drop that out, they clean the outside of it, take it apart, make sure everything works, put it back together. Do that so I actually did almost every single part of that in the gearbox department. So I didn't drop them out of the car, but cleaned every I cleaned I think every component of those gearboxes, uh, make sure they're not cracked, everything works, measured well. Um, my favorite I enjoyed doing that. My favorite was working with the classics. A lot of these cars have a lot of history. Uh, they have cars all the way back from the early 70s up until this the newest car that they had in the classics, which raced in 2015. So that was really cool. The highlight of that was I got to go up to Mid Ohio last week and see them run around the track. BMW take, says every year all of your working classics take them up to Mid Ohio and we'll shoot promotional footage and stuff like that. So they had 10, 11, 11 working cars out of the 25. Um, so we got to run them, clean them. So that was that was really neat. So loading them is a lot like the Child's Game rush hour ever seen that you've got the little grid got all the little cars you need to work one out and that's basically what we did but these are there's three of these in the world so they're kind of priceless cars and they weigh 2,000 pounds so it's a little bit more complicated than uh, just shuffling little plastic pieces around the board uh, so what did I learn from pushing and cleaning your medial work pays off so especially those first two weeks I swept a lot of floors cleaned a lot of cars when you do that you take it with a smile on your face your, your mentor really notices that, the people you work with really notice that, so they're like, oh, so instead of just cleaning cars, you also want to push them, so I'm like, sure, that would be fun. Or do you want to work on uh, transmissions for actual race cars that actively race? Sure. Uh, so that's really cool. There's a lot of things that you see working somewhere like that that you wouldn't otherwise. Building shelves is an example. You know, when you watch the 8500 on TV, a car comes out of the garage, goes racing, it comes back, you don't really realize they need shelves to store all those parts, or every component needs to be cleaned when it's done, or uh, you know, cleaned. Most of these cars are disassembled. Uh, even on the track day, there was we had two cars that ended up, three cars that ended up uh, having some sort of problem when we were in Mid Ohio. So to take basically just take start taking parts out until we can find where the problem is, fix that part, and put it back together. That seeing how all that works together, the team aspect, I think there's it's about 40 people who work only at that facility. 
about 20 of them go to race days. So it's a pretty exhausting uh, time. When I was in Mid Ohio, I worked multiple 14 hour work days. And that's, as we're on one of those teams, that's a normal thing. You do that multiple times a month. So I know, like, that's a lot. It's a long day. It's fun, but it's not. Doing that is a really high stress thing. And I don't think I'd like to do it. I got to do some mechanical experience. Uh, we got to disassemble one of the cars. They put uh, right, right along seats in it, and that's a really involved job. Basically, we've got all the body panels and uh, replacing the fuel tank and that sort of stuff. Really uh, cool to get to work on, see how these things work. Kind of seeing that, so uh, switching gears. Uh, my first walkabout, so going back to January. So I was able to do this in the Mountain Collective Pass, which is a, the best deal in skiing. So when you buy a pass, you get two free days of skiing at 14 resorts around the world. 11 of them are in the American West and Canada, so I was like, I'm gonna go ski all those. And so that worked out to about $2,600 of skiing, the pass is $390, so that's a profit about $2,200 if you were to do that. So that's a pretty hard deal to pass up. Uh, I visited along the way seven national parks as well. There's a lot of those in the West, so. Did that. I did it almost entirely alone. I stayed with some friends and that sort of stuff, but all the traveling I did alone. All the skiing stuff one day I was alone, that sort of stuff. Uh, I chose this one, it's a great deal, it's hard to pass up that, and there's no other time I'm going to be able to do something like this. I enjoy traveling. I've spent, uh, I've done a few trips to the American West, and I've loved every time I've gone out, so I was like, why not do it for seven weeks this time instead of one or two? And I wanted to get a goggle tent, so this is a batch of water <laughs> among uh, a batch of water among skiers. So the rest of you crazy tent except for your goggles. So you can tell I did not get one of those. So uh, one goal I did not achieve. So a few statistics, <laughs> and a few statistics from this walkabout. So it was 51 days, so just over seven weeks, and 24 of those I, sp I spent skiing. So almost half the days I was out, I was skiing. Uh, I visited a total of 12 resorts out there. I, I skied 457,000 vertical feet. So, with uh, that perspective, like if I were to jump off, you know, on skis off the top of this building, that's like 40 vertical feet of ski. Or Mad River is about 300. One run at Mad River is about 300 vertical feet. My initial goal before my walkabout was like, I want to ski a million. And so I skied my first day in Aspen. I was like, I don't know. I, I don't think that's going to be possible. Um, so I'll, I'll back it off to three quarters of a million. And then as the trip progressed, I was like, that's not happening either. So I'm going to back it off to half an hour. <laughs> and as you can see, I didn't achieve that. However, I'm within 10%, so that's an A. So that's like, that's fine. That's fine, on, uh, fine for me. So I drove over 10,000 miles. That's a lot of driving to do about four hours a day. You need something to do. Eventually, your Spotify playlist gets a little stale. So I started listening to a lot of audiobooks. I listened to 14 audiobooks on my trip, and then read an additional six. And so I visited, during this I visited a total of 18 states and provinces, two in two countries, so US and Canada. Only one car accident, there was no damage to the car. Uh, really lucky, no sunburns, again, really lucky about that one. And a lot of ibuprofen. So uh, <laughs> the problem is my ski boots would bruise my ankles and my calves, uh, my knees, 24 days of skiing and seven weeks is a lot of skiing. Uh, so my knees got kind of abused. So pretty much every day after about the second week, I would need to take Advil. Every day I skied. About half the day, so I wasn't skiing, I would as well. Uh, so this was my itinerary. So you can see Ohio over here, Columbus. And basically, it's this is a great drive. You just get on I-70 and you just stay on it for about 1,300 miles, and then you get to the mountains. Uh, so you know, RMP Aspen around and then up north through Canada. Uh, so Canada up here, I got to watch the Super Bowl in Canada, in Revelstoke. That was a lot of fun explaining football to a bunch of Canadians. Uh, we entered the United States here near Vancouver and Seattle, stayed in Seattle. If you do something like this, never drive from Seattle to San Francisco in a day. That, it's a 15 hour day, uh, I did that alone. And fun fact though, if you have a 2007 Honda Element, you only have 6251. $62.51. You can get there $62.50. Not that I would know. Uh, we're on Yosemite, back around the Sierras, and then back here. So that's where you get the, the 10,000 miles from. Uh, a lot of driving. So what did I do? So about 40, 
40% uh, of the nights were spent in my car, so just under half. So Honda Elements are tremendous cars for stuff like this. Their seats fold flat, so I could actually leave the sleeping bag out permanently. I had enough other stuff in my car, though, I needed to um, move it around. When it, so whenever I got somewhere, I would generally have put my jacket back on because it was really cold. And then play a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle to get everything moved out of my out of the sleeping area, the cooking area, and then get it into primarily the driver's seat, stack it up elsewhere, cook, and then the next morning I would do basically the process in reverse and then go skiing, hiking, driving, whatever it was on for that day, and then return and cook read. So any other that's roughly 60% of the other time was spent either with friends or in hostels. Uh, Kansas awesome, that hostels are my group. Uh, so yeah, like I said, four hours a day driving. The two of my favorite places, uh, one was Alta in Salt Lake City. So uh, Alta is very well known for its snow. It snows, uh, well, while I was there, I was there for three days and skied three days there and snowed three feet. And actually I've had it continue for another 10 days after I left. Uh, but the last day I was there was a Saturday. And so this drive, I was already, I, uh, it was a Saturday, so everybody in the state of Utah wanted to go skiing, which I don't, I don't blame, you know, skiing waist deep out is pretty cool. But this drive, the previous two days on Thursday and Friday, took me half an hour, it took me three and a half to get up there, it was, a, it was a crawl. You can see, it's hard to see in this photo, uh, this dude skiing needy powder. It's, it was a pretty good day. A little chilly, but uh, all in all, pretty fantastic. And then the other was Yosemite National Park in California. So I kind of got into skiing through rock climbing, and this is the birth of American rock climbing. So I've seen these pictures for years, and tunnel view, this big one, it's, you, you know, you see the photos, it's like one of the most classic photos. And you're like, this is amazing, it's so cool. And you get there and it's it's unbelievable. Like, every single oh, picture don't do it justice, but it really doesn't. I mean, the El, El Capitan here is just the most, it's the biggest thing you've ever seen. Like, it's it's unbelievable how big it is. Uh, rock climbing has a National Historic Registered site, so um, rock climbing is a sport, don't tell me otherwise. <laughs> so, what did I do on the, so, conclusion. Uh, driving 2,000 miles is a lot of driving, uh, four hours a day. Doing it alone, eventually you're, you're just kind of like spent, you're like, all right, I need to be home, not driving. Like I said, frequency of skiing, managing expectations. So I was like, okay, I'm skiing like, you know, needing powder every day. That's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be cooking all my own meals. It'll be awesome. And then come back from the day skiing like blue ice, and it was like zero degrees. And you're like, well, I don't have any water. So I'm just going to eat uncooked ramen in my car because I don't have anything else. So you need to like think that not everything is going to go how you expect it. Uh, that kind of plays into this, this other point. You need to be flexible. Things are going to go sideways. Your windshield is going to crack. You're going to crash. You're going to run out of food. But you need to still plan everything. If you're not planning it, you're not doing it. So that's kind of how it is. Social interactions. Uh, I. I love, I love this. The first week, um, Mark, Mark Shannon, one of the teachers here, was reading my journals. And, then, and his response was like, all right, so I want you to talk to as many people on the ski lift as possible. And I read that, and I'm like, I'm not doing that. Like, whatever, I'm here to ski. It doesn't matter. But when you spend, like, a solid 90% of, like, your waking hours basically alone, it gets, like, a little great. So, like, third weekend, I was trying to talk to every single person. <laughs> and not only was it nice to, like, talk to people, but the people that you meet are so cool. You meet, I met, actually, a lot of Australians, especially in Canada, because uh, it's summer down there, so they're on summer break. Uh, a lot of Nor Norwegians and Swedes, interestingly enough. Uh, but super cool people everywhere you go. It's awesome. Uh, like I said, consumed 20 books on my walkabout. So uh, before this, I'd never really appreciated literature all that much. And writing, I had to write three pages a week. And so that's not even that much, especially doing what I was doing. But then that paired with how much I was reading, like really showed me an appreciation. I really gained an appreciation of, of uh, reading and writing. Um, Google Maps is not the most reliable thing, especially when weather is uh, poor. I was relocated to closed roads three times. It told me the road was closed and it wasn't twice. 
and you just need to have your head on straight. Just, you go there and you're like, it's closed, what's the other option? Uh, these were all of my lift tickets from all 12 resorts that I visited. I've never been happier to see the sign oh. in my entire life. <laughs> uh, this, was, this was day two of like 12 hour driving days back in Colorado. Uh, and finally, and finally uh, things are only gonna happen if you make them. So this is, this is on both walkabouts. Um, the first day, I, the nights before I left my first walkabout, I barely slept. And when the day came, it's like, well, I was delayed a little bit from weather, but it was either I'm going to do this or I'm not. And so it's only going to happen if I get in my car and drive. And so that's the only option. And so, yeah, you can sit and say, well, it's just not going to happen and think about what could go wrong, but it doesn't matter until you do it, you're not going to find the experience from it. And that, that carries over from skiing, you're like, this is terrifying, this is twice as steep as anything in Ohio. I've never skied anything this steep, but you got to just clip on your skis and do it and then fall on the first turn. <laughs> um, but you know, that's the only way you learn. So, uh, yeah. So, any questions? On the BMWs, how, how pricey were they? Uh, the classics, the cheapest one was uh, $80,000, the most expensive was close to $11 million. <laughs> Michelle? How long did it take you to plan your trip? Um, on and off, like about five months, but that wasn't like just thinking every day about it. Uh, if I really sat down, I could probably do it in a few weeks. Uh, but yeah, a few months. So what was your primary food? Sorry. No, that's all right. Did you get to drive any of the BMWs? Uh, I got to drive the cheapest one, the $80,000. <laughs> <laughs> Not even on a track, it was in your back to the garage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Sorry, what were you? What was your primary food? Uh, pasta. Pa a lot of pasta, a lot of macaroni and cheese. I made tacos a few times, so those were tremendous. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, oh. primarily pasta. Pasta, can't change. Anything else? Any other questions from Sam? Next time, take a chef with it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah.